Welcome back to Blazers Uprise's Top 100 Players Series for the 2022-2023 NBA season. This is a reminder to subscribe to NBA Uprise, where we'll be doing NBA content during the course of the season. Link in the description box below. With that being said, let's jump into it. Josh Giddy was an impressive rookie last season, averaging 12.5 points per game, almost 8 rebounds, and 6.5 assists per game. The 6'8 point forward isn't the most efficient player. Shot 49% from 2 last year, but only 26% from 3. He will need to improve his 3 point jump shot. However, if he does, he is going to be an absolute menace on the offensive end because he's extremely crafty and can make plays for himself and others. This ranking reflects some assumed second year in improvement for Giddy in the two clear-cut areas where that should happen is his three-point shot and potentially on the defensive end. I don't think he'll ever be a positive defensive player, but as long as he can just simply be adequate, that should be good enough for a player that can do the things that he can on the offensive end. Jonas Valanciunas, in his first season in New Orleans last year, had a career high in points per game, averaging almost 18 of them. 11 boards, 2.5 assists, and 54% from the field, 36% from 3 on 2 attempts per game, and Valanciunas put up a very respectable stat line for the Pelicans. While he is a bit of a throw it back big man, who maybe isn't the best defender, although I think he's adequate on that end, he's a phenomenal rebounder, a great finisher on the interior, and can shoot the 3 ball. He's also a quality free throw shooter, shot 82% from the charity stripe last year. Valanciunas is just a really solid, well rounded rounded big man without many weaknesses to his game. Kristaps Porzingis got traded from the Dallas Mavericks to the Washington Wizards at last year's NBA trade deadline. The return for him wasn't great. The Mavericks got back Spencer Dinwiddie and Davis Bertans, and it was a bit of a shocking trade. Last season, Porzingis averaged 20 points per game, 8 rebounds, a little over 2 assists, shooting 46% from the field and only 31% from 3. However, his 3-point percentage in 17 games for the Wizards to close out the year was 37%. Porzingis has become injury prone after he tore his ACL in the 2018-2019 season. He's averaged right around 50 games for the last three years. He's also not the same defensive player he used to be. He's lost a little bit of a step in that regard, but offensively, given his height, he's still a very talented player, and he looked really good in Washington. Expect Porzingis to be a clear-cut number two option next to Bradley Beal next season. Lou Dort is an interesting player. He got a contract extension paying him $17 million a year this past offseason after he's established himself as one of the best perimeter defenders in the entire NBA. Offensively, he averaged 17 points per game last year, but it wasn't efficient. 40% from the field, 33% from three, true shooting of 54%. However, that was coming for a tanking OKC team where Dort probably played a bigger offensive role than he would need to for a better team. Dort is still only 23 years of age and still has some time to develop his offensive game. Given the fact that he's already able to put up 17 points per game, albeit on slightly below average efficiency, that's still impressive for a player of his defensive caliber. As OKC continues to improve, it'll be interesting to see how Lou Dort's offensive role evolves. Sadiq Bey has established himself as a core piece of the Detroit Pistons rebuild. Last season, he averaged 16 points per game, over 5 boards, and almost 3 assists, shooting 40% from the field and a shade under 35% from 3. This was for a tanking Detroit team, where Sadiq Bey was tasked with potentially a little bit more creation responsibility than he would be on a better team. That could explain his efficiency dipping from his rookie season. However, Sadiq Bey had some monster games last season. He now gets the luxury of playing next to not only Cade Cut as he continues to develop, but also Jay Nivey. On the other side of the ball, Bay is a quality defensive player. I still think there's room for growth there, and I think next season Bay will continue to establish himself as a more efficient 3 and D player that can do some things off the dribble. 
Tobias Harris honestly is one of the most overpaid players in the league, making about $35 million a year. However, he's still a quality player, averaged 17 points per game, 7 rebounds and 3.5 and assists last season on 48% field goals and 37% threes. His efficiency is solid, however, I don't think he takes enough threes. Three quarters of his shots are inside the arc, and Harris is prone to stopping the ball a bit at times. As the third option playing off James Harden and Joel Embiid, Harris would probably help the 76ers win more games if he just spotted up and shot more three-pointers. However, he is a guy that can do some things off the dribble. I would like for him to get to the free throw line more, but he does create for others at times. His fit is just a little bit weird as that third guy, but his talent still lands him on this list. Josh Hart got traded from the New Orleans Pelicans to the Portland Trailblazers at last year's NBA trade deadline. That, of course, was the CJ McCollum trade. And in Portland, Josh Hart looked phenomenal. In 13 games, averaging 32 minutes per game, he averaged 20 points, 5.5 boards, and over 4 assists, shooting 61% from 2 and 37% from 3. Now, if I believed he could replicate that for the entirety of next season, he would be higher on this list. However, Josh Hart is simply a guy who doesn't have many flaws. He's a career 35% three-point shooter. His three-point shot looked phenomenal in Portland. He was shooting some three-point looks that I'd never seen him shoot before, some off-the-dribble stuff. He's a really good rebounder for a wing. He can pass the ball. He's developed into a really good passer as well, and is relentless attacking the rim. Defensively, he's a good on-ball defender, and he plays really hard on that side of the ball. And at this point, he's become one of the more underrated players in the league. Franz Wagner, the 8th overall pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, was an all-rookie first-team selection last season after he averaged 15 points per game, 4.5 boards, and 3 assists for the Orlando Magic. He did this in under 31 minutes per game, shooting 51% from 2 and 35% from 3. This is very impressive numbers for a rookie who just recently turned 21 years old, and while it's hard to project exactly where his ceiling is and how good he could become, he's already Already a very high caliber starter going into his sophomore season. On the defensive end, he's a solid defensive player that has the upside to be good on that end as well. In today's day and age, it's hard to find forwards that shoot the three ball at a decent clip, can make plays for others create for himself off the dribble, and play defense. You could make the argument that Franz Wagner is already there with a lot more upside ahead of him. Being able to play off of number one overall pick Paulo Bancaro this year I think will make things even easier for Wagner, and I'm really excited to see what he has in store this season. Kyle Lowry had a dip in production last season, which is to be expected in a player who is now 36 years old. In his first season for the Miami Heat, after spending a decade in Toronto, Lowry's point per game average dipped from 17 to 13 points per game. His assists stayed around the same at seven and a half, and he shot 44% from the field and 38% from three. He's still one of the better point guards in the league and a quality veteran presence to have in a locker room. Defensively, he's still solid as well, but it'll be interesting to see as he ages even more if he loses a bit of a step there. However, I think he's a really good fit as the starting point guard in Miami next to a Jimmy Butler. He's not a guy that's going to make a ton of mistakes, and that lands him on this list. Last season saw RJ Barrett average 20 points per game for the New York Knicks, alongside 6 rebounds and 3 assists. However, it was not an efficient season for Barrett as he saw a dip in 2 point percentage and 3 point percentage. He shot 44% from 2. 34% from 3, with a true shooting percentage of only 51%. However, he's still barely 22 years of age, and Barrett is primed for some fourth year improvement. That improvement needs to come with his shot selection, as he definitely needs to improve his efficiency, and on the defensive end, but he definitely has talent scoring the ball. His second season saw him shoot 40% from 3, so he's shown he's capable of shooting a high clip from behind the arc, and he's one of those players who's on the edge of being really good if he's efficient, and really mediocre if he's not. I bet that RJ Barrett is going to be more efficient next season and be a top 100 player. That wraps up players 71 to 80. Hopefully you enjoyed. Stay tuned for tomorrow's video, which will be players 61 to 70. As I said at the start of this video, subscribe to NBA Uprise. Link in the description box below. And I'm out of here. Until next time, as always, peace out. Go Blazers.